Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 17th of April. And this quick look ahead of week beginning the 20th of April. And it's certainly been a very interesting week in terms of how equity markets have been doing relative to um, the data that's been coming out. Because let's not beat about the bush. The data that's been coming out has been pretty diabolical um, when all is said and done. And yet equity markets seem to be fairly relaxed about it. Um, we've seen the major US banks report their latest uh, first quarterly numbers. And by and large, um, they've been fairly decent. But what has been notable um, from these banks has been the fact that um, They've set aside huge amounts of first quarter revision, provision for um, significant amounts of credit losses. Um, in total, around about 20 to $25 billion worth, um, which is roughly about the same amount of money they were setting aside on a quarterly basis in terms of buybacks last year. Last year, US banks set aside around about $108 billion, which they returned to shareholders in the form of buybacks. Um, which is just over $25 billion a quarter. In this particular quarter, they've set aside that $25 billion, which they were hoping to return to shareholders and set it aside in respect of credit losses. So that's JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Bank of America, um, Morgan Stanley and Goldman's. Um, the biggest amount of those provisions has been a, between four banks, namely JP Morgan, 8 billion, Wells Fargo, 4 billion, and Citigroup and Bank of America around about eight or nine billion between those two. So significant amounts of capital um, that have been set aside in respect of a huge tsunami of potential credit losses as US unemployment um, jumps sharply in the month of March. We've seen from the jobless claims numbers that we've seen over the past four weeks that 22 million Americans have filed for jobless claims which makes the 1st of May payrolls numbers going to be a particularly interesting webinar to do um, when we cover those numbers on Friday, the 1st of May. So what we've seen today early on is equity markets gap higher. You can see that on the S&P 500 chart here. We've broken above the 50 day moving average after closing on the up um, on the back of this story that came out after US close on Thursday night that Gilead Sciences was getting positive results on COVID-19 patients from its experimental viral drug Remdesivir. Um, so this is just a bit of a report. Markets have seized upon it, you know, almost on the basis that it's some sort of vaccine. It isn't. Um, it's just a treatment that um, has been on trial, uh, has been having clinical trials in a hospital in Chicago. So um, markets have seized upon that and it's overshadowed some pretty horrible Chinese first quarter GDP numbers that came out this morning, a 6.8% contraction in Q1. But what was particularly notable about that was that was the retail sales numbers. The retail sales numbers for February, when the economy was in lockdown, showed a decline of 20.5%. Now, there was a limited reopening of the economy in March but consumers stayed at home. There was a 15.8% decline in retail sales in March. And that suggests to me that for all this week's optimism from equity market investors about the fact that some of European countries are starting to do limited relaxations of their lockdowns, that um, economic activity is somehow magically going to return to normal is, how should we say, it's a little bit yeah, it's a it's a little bit hard to believe because whatever you say about what's happening and what's happened over the past four or five weeks, normal service will not be resumed for quite some time. Social distancing will be with us for quite some time. The UK lockdown has been extended for another three weeks. France has extended its lockdown to May the 11th and has already said that restaurants and bars won't open until July. So that suggests to me that any thoughts of a sharp V-shaped rebound is pretty much pie in the sky, yet markets are pricing that in. And I think that they could soon come to rue 
that optimism. But we'll see. You know, there is some form of Federal Reserve put, which is helping to put a floor under equity markets. So the big question is, which side of this push-pull scenario is going to win out over the course of the next few days, the next few weeks, the next few months? Is this a, a start of a new bull market rally, or is this a bear market rally? Is this a bull market rally? Is this a bull market rally in a, bear, in a new bear market? That we don't yet know. So that's something to really think about. But at the moment, while we're below the 200-day moving average, um, for me, it's very much a case of sell the rally, or certainly on a long-term basis. Um, we have broken higher on the S&P 500. We are certainly outperforming um, every other market in the world. Um, broken, broken above the 50% retracement level could well retest 61.8, which was the levels that we last saw in um, in March. This 29. 30 level, 29.40 in the 200-day moving average, which is just above that. But while we're below the 200-day moving average, um, you have to be a little bit suspicious of this current rebound. And certainly, US markets are slightly disconnected from pretty much markets everywhere else, particularly in Europe, where we are seeing markets struggle to overcome the previous highs that we've seen earlier this month. And that's particularly notable in DAX, and the FTSE 100. I'm going to start with the DAX because that's as good a place as any to start. But we can see that from the move lower, we're still below this very key resistance level here, 50% retracement. That's 10,880, 10,900. Also, the 50-day moving average. So that's quite a big barrier. We've seen an impulsive down move here of support at 10,180. Um, so that's that's a decent area of support on the downside. It also respects this 38.2 line that I've talked about here, but on the 50% level, that's the key level on the upside. If we want to see further gains in the DAX, we've really got to bust through this level here. It's a similar sort of story on the FTSE 100, and we can see that borne out on this chart here. That has really underperformed the rest of the wider market. It's not hard to see why when you look at the oil price, but certainly I think this 5,920 area on the FTSE is proving to be a little bit of a tough nut to crack, if truth be told. And we can see that borne out in this, this chart here. And we've also got the 50-day moving average above that. So um, 55,900 and then 6,235. So if we are able to really thrust through this level here at 5,920, there is scope for us to move back towards the 50-day moving average. Not completely holding my breath at this point in time, but as with any of these rebounds that we see in, in bear markets, they can be quite vicious and they can certainly overshoot towards the upside. So those are the key levels that I'm looking at on the S&P, the DAX and the FTSE 100. The NASDAQ, would you believe it, has actually um, managed if tr quite amazingly to basically wipe out its losses for the entire year in the up move that we're currently seeing in the futures markets. But let's now start to move on to next week and look at what I'm keeping an eye out for over the course of the next few days. And it's very much UK centric. We we already know from the US that we've seen huge amounts of job losses over the course of the past four weeks in March. Well, now we're going to get a look at the UK because we have UK jobless claims for March, which are due out on the 21st of April. Um, we also have the unemployment numbers for the three months to February and the wages data for the three months to February. To be honest, ladies and gentlemen, we can completely disregard them. They're old news. They don't matter. Unemployment rate was 3.9%. It certainly isn't that now. Wages were trending at around about 3.1, 3.2%. Again, that doesn't really matter when you've had over a million people file for universal credit. So, even though the March job, even though the February jobless claims showed a rise of 17,300, I think we can safely assume that March jobless claims are going to be much, much higher, with the only question being by how much. So let's look at the key levels on the cable. We can see that the 200 day moving average is acting as a little bit of a barrier on the upside. We can see that there, it's around about 125.30, uh, and has acted as a double tap 
on the upside there in these two candles here, which suggests that we could get a little bit of a pullback. That's almost a bearish engulfing day. Not quite, but it's good as. So that does suggest that in the short term, there's a little bit of a near term top in, which could suggest that we might see a drift back to around about 122.40, 122.50. But I don't expect us to see too much of a vicious sell off unless the dollar rallies quite strongly, because I still think that the pound should outperform the euro, because however bad the UK data is, and we also have retail sales for March out on the 23rd, and they're likely to be disappointing as well with expectations of a decline of 2.3% if you include fuel in that, because in lockdown, people don't go anywhere, they don't drive anywhere, they don't use any fuel. And while we will probably see a surge in food and other supermarket sales in the lead up to um, this retail sales number, um, other sales could well fall off quite sharply in terms of clothing uh, and other types of other consumer discretionaries. Online sales should do quite well. Um, I've been buying bits and bobs online, but certainly haven't been spending an awful lot of money. Um, so that would suggest that March retail sales could be a bit of a shocker. 23rd of April, that's due out. We've also got the latest flash data for manufacturing and services. Now, manufacturing hasn't actually been that bad. It's sort of been to the low to mid 40s. And we're not expecting a, a much of a drop below 40 on the manufacturing side. It's the services side that's likely to be the weak link because that's very much consumption driven, hotels, services, hospitality, um, bars and what have you. So that's likely to fall below the levels that we saw in March, which was 35.7. It's probably going to be in the mid to high 20s, 25, between 25 and 30. So that's that's going to be a little bit of a shocker. And they, and they, they are due out on the 23rd. But however bad, the UK PMIs are likely to be the France manufacturing, French and German manufacturing and services flash PMIs are likely to be pretty much in the same boat. Um, and that would suggest to me that really it's a question of the least worst option when it comes to looking at euro and the pound. And at the, at the moment, I'm fairly bearish euro sterling, bullish sterling, bearish euro. So that would suggest to me that now we've broken below this 200 day moving average. And those of you who are fairly regular listeners of um, my um, my weekly updates will know that uh, I've been I've been pretty bearish on euro sterling um, all the way down now that we've broken below the 200 day moving average. Um, as long as we stay below these two moving averages here, the 200 day and the, uh, and the 50 day, with the stop loss at around about 88, we could well see a move back towards 86 and even 85 in the short term because the disjointed policy response from the EU with respect to the more badly hit members of Spain and Italy when it comes to the, um, the pandemic, I think is likely to weigh on the euro going forward. And as a result, while I can certainly see a uh, scope for euro dollar to test quite a bit lower, I can't really say the same thing with respect to the pound simply because I think that the UK policy response for all its faults, and there are many, at least it's joined up. You've got the UK Treasury uh, talking to the Bank of England. There is, some, there is a bit of, there's a much more harmonious relationship when it comes to a policy response on the fiscal side than there is in Europe. So the key level on the downside in Euro dollar, I'm looking at 107.80 on the downside, it coincides with these lows down here, looking for a retest of these lows that we saw in the middle of March. Okay, so um, got weekly jobless claims out of the US, it's likely to be another bad number, but really it's not really gonna be reflected in the payrolls report on the 1st of May. We know that the payrolls report from the 1st of May is gonna be an absolute shocker. I'll be covering that in a webinar then, so please feel free to sign up to that. That'll be happening uh, between 1.15 and 1.45 on Friday the 1st of May. In terms of earnings, there's a couple of items that I've got a particular eye on one of which um, is Netflix. Now, Netflix, at its most recent earnings update, there was plenty of speculation that they might get knocked off course by the combined challenges of Disney Plus and Apple TV. Well, investors don't seem to think so, not judging by this chart here. We've hit record highs for Netflix over the course of the past two or three days. We've also done the same thing with Amazon. Um, they've also hit record highs over the course of the past three days, two or three days. And for me, the key 
um, I think the key data point that I'm looking out for with respect to Netflix is their subscribers. They were expected, they were hoping to add 7 million new subscribers in the first quarter of this year. Now, I will be surprised if they don't break that because when they made that prediction um, in January, there was no talk of lockdowns. There was no talk of people staying at home. There was no talk of people basically binge watching box sets. So these should be a fairly decent set of numbers for Netflix. And there has been some talk that they might actually be able to beat on profits and revenue with the very real possibility they may be able to achieve a goal of a positive cash flow by year end. Well, if something like this can't get them to achieve a positive cash flow by year end, then I don't know what will. So it's all to play for for Netflix. Can they justify their current sky high valuation? Um, that's the big question as we look towards their numbers, which are out on 21st of April. We've also got Unilever, um, big blue chip on the FTSE 100. They got their first quarter numbers out on the 23rd of April. And it's not particularly been a great six months for Unilever. The shares are well down from their peaks last year. It's a global food and staples company. Well, food and staples are selling like hot cakes at the moment, no pun intended. But um, they should be doing an awful lot better, despite the fact that they've got challenging conditions in all of their markets. Um, they reckon that they would get first half growth coming in just below 3%. So um, we'll have to see whether or not the sale of generic brands has hurt the sales across its divisions. I would suggest it probably won't. We'll certainly see a pickup in personal and home care division in this half due to panic buying on these types of products. But, you know, it really depends on whether or not you feel that a company like Unilever is a decent place or our investors think a company like Unilever is a decent place to put their hard earned capital to work. So um, just quickly round this up by looking at Brent crude oil. Um, that's taken a little bit of a pasting over the course of the past few days, but certainly not in the realms of WTI, which has hit the lowest level since 2002. Um, we are looking to retest the lows, but it is proving to be slightly more resilient than, say, for example, its WTI counterpart. Nonetheless, um, at the moment, the line of least resistance for Brent crude, because of the collapse in demand, is towards the downside. But there is decent resistance around these highs at $32 a barrel, $32, um, $33 a barrel, simply because the perception is the production cuts that were agreed by OPEC Plus aren't considered to be anywhere near enough. You can talk about 10 million a barrel a day production cut as much as you like. If your demand is dropping by 20 million barrels a day, then you've got a bit of a problem. And I'm actually surprised that Brent isn't, isn't actually lower and hasn't followed um, WTI low because at the moment, the gap between Brent and WTI is around about $8 a barrel, which is actually fairly wide when you consider what the uh, spread has been in recent weeks and months. Let's finish up with gold. Um, that's made another new highest level since 2012. Um, starting to see a little bit of a pullback from the new highs um, that we saw over the course of the past few days. We could slip all the way back to around about 1650, but overall, I'm still maintaining that gold will probably hit $1,800 an ounce by the end of the year, given current market conditions. So that's, I think, it pretty much for uh, this week. Hopefully you found um, this brief summary fairly instructive. Um, and I um, hope you all enjoy your weekend consuming your um, Domino's Pizza, which is also which is also re releasing its first quarter numbers on the 23rd of April um, next week, and binge watching and um, binge watching on Netflix. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Wish you all a, a very nice weekend, and um, see and speak to you all um, same time next week. Thanks very much for listening.